ears, brains, imagination. These are our best tools for learning about music history. But wait, what is music history? When I first heard the term music history back in high school, I wasn't sure either. I thought my history teachers were kind of cool, but history to me meant kings, statesmen, and battles, plus too many dates to memorize. I didn't see how music fit with any of that, but I was wrong. Music is connected to everything. Politics, economics, religion, science, literature, technology, military, fashion, everything. To study music in any serious way, we have to consider every possible musical and non-musical factor. And when we do that, we are learning music history. To make the point, pick a piece of music that you like, one that you think is important or has meaning to you. It might be a classical piece or a country western song, a film score or jazz, Christian rock or techno, or a song from a musical. It doesn't matter, just as long as it means something in your life. Then think about this question. How would you explain this music to someone who will be born 20 years from now? How would you help someone in the future to understand it the way you do now? Now that's not an easy question. Look at the first exercise in your resource book. You'll want to answer the questions for the piece of music that you choose. And meanwhile, I'll take one of my own examples. The first Beatles hit, I Want to Hold Your Hand, recorded in 1963. I grew up in a small city in the Virginia mountains. We didn't travel anywhere. Pretty sheltered, I guess that's what you'd say. 1960s rock and roll exploded into my sheltered life. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Janis Joplin. The music reflected what I was reading in the newspapers and watching on TV. To use language I would use now, rock music reflected the enormous cultural changes that were shaping our society for better or worse. But there was one big moment when I broke out into the wider musical world. In seventh grade, I somehow bought a 45 single of the Beatles' new record, I Want to Hold Your Hand, with I Saw Her Standing There on the flip side. I had no idea that the Beatles would change music forever, and the Beatles didn't know that yet either. Amazingly, I was the first kid in my class to own this 45. For one glorious Friday, I was special because I had taken the record to school. By Monday, other kids had bought copies, so my special status faded. Nonetheless, I've never forgotten how grand I felt owning this record. It's hard to explain what owning one record meant back then to someone 15 years old today who can download the world's music onto an iPod. So if I had to put this Beatles tune in a cultural context, here's what I'd say. As to the song itself, it sounds harmless and innocent today, holding someone's hand after all. But back then, it came across as bold and suggestive, in part because it wasn't wrapped in romance the way the love songs of the big band era had been. Then I need to explain the forces that brought the Beatles into the average teenager's life, radio, television, plus magazines, and the excitement of going to the local record stores. I'd have to describe the new economics, where teenagers were becoming a market force in the music business. More and more of them had money to spend on records by Frank Sinatra, Frankie Avalon, Elvis, and the Beatles. And I'd have to talk about fashion, since despite looking clean cut compared to pop stars today, the Beatles were seen as scruffy types with unkempt long hair that we all wanted to imitate. I got my neighbor to cut off my hair into a bowl-shaped Beatles cut. I really did, and my mother was horrified, but I loved it. If I were able to explain all of these things, plus a few more, and draw the connection from those early Beatles hits to the full-blown explosion of rock and roll at Woodstock in 1969, then I would have created a good piece of music history. But wait, you say, it's possible to do that because a lot of people are still living from those times, starting with me. But no one is still alive who has memories of hearing music by Bach or Beethoven back when that music was new. That's true. None of us alive today heard Bach's organ playing in the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig in the 1730s. 
None of us sat around the trendy coffee shops in the early 1700s discussing political scandals while the latest music of Telemann sounded out in the courtyard. We weren't in the theater in 1853 at the first performance of Verdi's opera La Traviata. We just weren't there. Okay, that's true. But we can recreate those experiences if we use our three tools, our ears, our brains, and our imaginations, the working tools of music history. There are reasons why Plato said music is sovereign. There are reasons why music was one of the four subjects studied as part of the quadrivium in classical Greek education. And we're going to find out those reasons and use music as our key to unlock the past. The truth is, if you understand the forces that shape history, politics, and culture in a given era, then you can understand the popular music of that era. Conversely, if you understand the music of a given period, then you can use music as a tool to unlock history, politics, and culture. You can link music to literature, to the arts, to social thought, and even to science. And that's really the reason to study music history. One thing that can help us with history is to take it out of the box and look at it from a different perspective. That's certainly what Captain Scott O'Grady has experienced. A United States Air Force fighter pilot, he was shot down over Bosnia in 1995. His ordeal behind enemy lines and his rescue made world headlines. He certainly gained a new appreciation for the words of historical figures, and he experiences the power of those words by putting them with music. Let's listen. Many great men have spoken of their affection for the United States, and today it is proper that we remember some of them. Those words that you were reading are such strong words, and I'm sure you relate to them more than many, many people who have never faced the challenges you've faced. How, what do you think about when you read those words? Well, I love reading the quotes of patriots uh, from our past and even current day patriots because they have lived through a period of American history which we didn't experience, but we can see their love of their, the, the, the love that they have for our country and how they also, during their time, had to fight to obtain our freedom and how to stand on guard to secure it. Our, our freedoms are not guaranteed, even to this day. We are a very young nation in the course of history, and unless we look at our history and learn the lessons um, as to how our nation was birthed, what principles our nation was founded upon, and the cost of those that had to fight to obtain those freedoms, then we will not value our freedom today. That's why it's so important to learn history, American history, as well as to celebrate our history like in an event like this with music. Because a lot of the patriotic songs have come from people's experiences and from the outgrowth of our history as a nation. My God, how little don't really truly understand where we are today unless we understand where we've come from our past. And we don't know where we're going tomorrow and the direction we should take, not only with our own lives but with our country, unless again we understand our past. So history is so important to study. Now I'm going to share some of my observations about education directed especially to my American students. Are you ready? To start with, European cities have been developing Western culture for centuries, so their traditions are richer and their roots are deeper. European writers, painters, sculptors, composers, architects, and dancers have built their art on the shoulders of the many generations who came before them. 
Musicians in Italy, Germany, France, and England still sing choral pieces from the 1500s. They perform operas from the 1600s, and they fiddle away at symphonies from the 1700s. In America, this kind of music didn't even start trickling in until the 17th century. And when it did, it was very clearly imported music. It was considered an imported luxury. Let's look at some of the reasons why the arts hold a different place in America than they do in Europe. To start with, this European music was in different languages, and it used complicated instruments like the violin, the harpsichord, and the oboe, which only a few people coming to the New World had brought over on ships with them. Here's a second reason why the arts took a back seat in the New World. We didn't have kings. That's it. Just that simple. No kings, no dukes, no princes, no counts. We didn't have the whole system of privileged aristocrats who in Europe cultivated and promoted the arts to demonstrate their own power. Instead, we were the ragtag bunch of folks who rebelled against that aristocracy. We built this country with bold adventurers who jumped on horses and set off in covered wagons, shooting their way across the prairie. Of course, there were families who brought European aristocratic traditions to the New World with them, and for the most part, they set up shop on the East Coast in cities like Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. Not surprisingly, that's where our first symphony orchestras and schools of music were founded. But overall, European styles of music didn't fit so well into our new American life. I like to joke it's kind of hard to keep a harpsichord tuned or dry in a covered wagon. A banjo, however, is a different matter. Remember, too, our early settlers brought different ideas about church music to these shores. Many of them came with traditions that required extremely simple church music with no accompanying instruments. And when composers here began writing the new American church music, they didn't have imposing cathedrals with big pipe organs. Churches were lucky to have any instruments at all. We also didn't have strings of palatial concert halls, royal theaters, or opera houses with golden boxes, and on and on. No kings, no ancient cathedrals, no palaces, and no gilded theaters with brilliant chandeliers and red velvet curtains, at least not at first. Whatever art we created needed to fit into a new mold. And here's the third point, which comes directly off the second. Because we didn't have kings and dukes promoting the arts, the arts were never viewed as symbols of political power in America. In fact, they were seen in an opposite light, as a complete luxury. America was a place to be explored and settled. So, horticulturists and fishermen, map makers and inventors, wheelwrights and gunsmiths, soldiers and statesmen, these people had important things to contribute. What mattered was physical strength, bravery, skill at shooting, trapping and building, and the ability to create the necessities of life on the frontier. The arts weren't practical or useful enough, at least that's what many people thought. Believe it or not, that's one reason why kids in America, even today, who are serious about school choir and band, painting or dance, are frequently teased and taunted, especially boys, while kids who are just moderately successful in athletics get a lot of hero worship. But in Europe, as you will see, the situation was quite different. Now, I want to talk about something that's very important to me, this business about how Americans are supposedly so incapable of learning history, languages, and literature. First, let's take history. It's a lot harder to learn history well when you can't see, hear, or feel its effects, and that's the position most Americans are in. Let's talk about monuments, for example. You can't grow up in Europe and not walk past monuments, statues, sculptures, whatever you want to call them. Even in places where everything was destroyed in World War II, there are new monuments and plaques to mark the places where historical spots used to be. So the most clueless kids walking down European streets have to absorb some of the history. Every day, they see marble busts of statesmen standing on granite pedestals, or bronze princes sitting up on horseback, 
or fountains filled with Neptunes and nymphs, all flanked by cobblestone streets and ancient parks. At the very least, it constantly reminds these kids that important things happened long before they were born. We have an equally rich history here in the United States, and while some of it is visible in buildings and monuments, especially in East Coast cities, most of it is found in our magnificent geography, in rivers and canyons mapped by brave explorers, in mountains and ridges sacred to generations of Native Americans, and in valleys and plains where battles were fought and blood was spilled. It's a different frame of reference. From my house in Monte County, Texas, I look directly out on a place called Queen's Peak. Local folks frequently tell me how lucky I am to see it every day because it is both the highest peak in the county, just shy of 1,200 feet, now don't laugh all you people who live in the Rockies, and Queen's Peak served as a sacred spot for the Native Americans who populated this region. At one point, there was a settlement of 250 settlers at Queen's Peak. More than one fierce battle was fought at the foot of this peak between U.S. soldiers and settlers and the Comanche Indians. Some of the old timers I know have extensive collections of arrowheads and other items they found at the base of Queen's Peak. These folks are true scholars and historians preserving the history of this geographical monument. And while there's supposed to be some kind of little plaque out there on a dirt road that commemorates Queen's Peak, I haven't been able to find it. So unless local people had told me about Queen's Peak, I never would have known that it was anything other than a rocky hill on the west side of old Belcherville Highway. And a visitor driving down that road probably never even would notice the peak at all, much less inquire about its history. I like to take my friends to Queen's Peak and see if its history speaks to them. The thing about Queen's Peak, when we came out here, everyone says, go see Queen's Peak. Go see. And this, to me, became the example of, of the difficulties of learning history when it's our history shrouded in, I think you like that term, mystery. It is shrouded in mystery. And I mean, uh, I always think about some of these poems that get handed down, the, the, the Native American chants. And you really don't know because so many of those are translated. And we were talking earlier about how Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a lot of his translations sound like they come out of Goethe, you know, I mean, that, that type of thing. But yet so many of the translations are, how much are they really connecting to the people that once were up there and once chanted and once said poems for their weddings and poems for their burials and poems for the crops and poems for the sun over there. Every day. Every right? day. Every day. So when the sun went down, there would be what we call a poem, but that's too limited a sense of that word, is it not? I mean, when I say poem to most people, they think it's on a page, you know, and, but that's not what they were doing to the that's, sun. I don't think they would ever have called it a poem, but we don't know. But I mean, they, they would have a, it would be part of their ritual and part of their culture and part of who they were. And when they said this, and it was handed down to this generation and that generation. That was the connection, because I think more than whatever you look at, whether it's a poem or whatever you may call it, it was the connection that they had, and they were having to the people in the past and the people that were coming after them. And that's, the, to me, the real beauty, and, and there's a beauty in the mystery, and, and there's a beauty in a way that we don't really know that much about it, other than these translations and this seeming like we're getting there a little bit, you know. It's sort of like going upstream, you know, we go up uh, in the mountains, you know, you, you go upstream to think where the water may actually begin, but you don't know if you can ever quite find it because is that just a little spring coming out of here or is, or is that just something, a rivulet coming there? You're never quite sure exactly where it begins. Queen's Peak, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing to me. Okay, I think we said enough about the difference in perception that Europeans and Americans have of history. So let's take literature. In Europe, writers and poets are regarded as founding fathers, maybe more important than our own founding fathers. They're honored for laying out the aesthetic and intellectual standards of their culture. They are responsible for fomenting revolution and for changing political fortunes. Even if they were poor and powerless in their lifetimes, their written legacy was charged with power. 
Imagine if Americans peppered their conversation with statements like, well, that reminds me of what Nathaniel Hawthorne or Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote when he described such and such, or, gosh, Mom, Emily Dickinson said it better in such and such phrase. Come on, how many Americans do that? We don't even quote our real founding fathers that often. But across the Atlantic, writers like Goethe and Voltaire, Diderot and Schiller, Dickens and Shakespeare are frequently quoted as if they were still walking around making news today. In fact, a kid strolling to school in a German town is likely to see splashed across the side of a perfectly normal apartment building a pithy quote from Schiller, maybe accompanied by some very cool graffiti. Even folks who aren't well educated or who are completely uninterested in literature still will absorb these words when they pass down the streets. Now, I don't want to leave you with the idea that all of our perceptions in Europe and America are completely different. One thing we share equally is a vast treasury of children's poetry and song, much of it brought over to this country directly from Europe. And it's important that people value children's literature for the cultural legacy that it is. Furthermore, children's literature in any language can help a young person understand many of the emotions and circumstances that will be faced in the future. That's why up until recently, it was methodically taught in schools and in most families. Carol, thank you so much for bringing me into this wonderful place. It's great, it's, isn't it? And it's called nostalgia. It's absolutely, it is nostalgia <laughs> and it's called nostalgia and it's, it's sort of a heartbeat of our little community here. I love it. I love it. I mean, I could just spend all day long in a place like this and then this is, you know, and, and you get, and you've brought your book along, 1,000 Poems for Children. That's I mean, my number one piece probably of nostalgia in my life. Oh, well, tell me uh, about well, it. I want to hear what it. I can tell you about it, you know, partly I've got all sorts of stuff is stuffed in it, which is part of a good book, isn't it? Right. And apparently I, I colored it, as you can see. Great. Not, not bad, either. Great. But it was given to me in 1958 for Christmas by my wow. mother. So, you know, that was a big thing to give a little kid. That's 51 years ago. Well, I know it. I mean, I, I don't want to go too far Well, there. it was definitely 51 <laughs> years ago. A thousand points for children, which would have sounded like an awfully big number at that point, you know? So, I guess this book has accompanied me through my whole life, and I, I guess it's kind of, well... Some people would say it's in bad shape, but uh -uh. what would you say uh -uh. about it? You know what I, what I like about this book? Tell me. I like that this is a battered book. It's pretty battered. This, this is a book that's falling apart. Yeah. It's probably you're going to be taped up here from before too long. Yeah. But it's also be. a book that's opened over and over and over that's again. And I remember reading this book at night. I mean, this was sort of a when you were afraid to go to sleep or had bad dreams. That Something about these poems even though I didn't always under, well, understand them. I, I used them to, like, friends. They were my friends, in a way. Does that Absol make any sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, is that how children relate to poems? I think so. I, I, and, you know, it's funny in a way. I mean, I think, uh, I think people did get away from poetry for a while, and that's why I like the whole nostalgia yeah. thing. You know, when I was growing up, my father subscribed to Field and Stream magazine. My mother got the Ladies' Home Journal. Right. And every month, Field and stream, there would be poems in there. You're kidding. Uh -uh. What there'd kind of a, poems? Well, there would be about hunting and fishing and so forth, but there were poems. And my father and mother, both neither of whom were, you know, they weren't academics in many ways. They never finished school, but they read poetry. We read poetry in our house all the time. Out loud? Or? Out loud. And, uh, you know, and yeah, that was that was part of it. How, and, how did it come about? I and mean, you'd say, now we're going to sit down and read poetry? Or was it, it sort of... Well, usually it'd be, it'd usually be, well, like with the field and stream, my father would, and when he would read it in their magazine, then he would read it to us. Here's a good one. Mm -hmm. Listen to that this. Say. And we'd stop and we'd listen. And it was fun. And look at this one here. How many kids have been read to sleep? Well, this one, I'm fortunate because when one time when the power went out at our house, yeah. I could, didn't need the book. And I could do this one because it's one I'd learned by heart. Oh, by heart. Okay. Wink and blink and nod one night. Oh, yeah. Sailed off in a wooden shoe, sailed on a river of crystal light into a sea of dew. Where are you going and what do you wish? The old moon asked the three. We have come to fish for the herring fish that live in this beautiful sea. <laughs> the old moon laughed and sang a song as they rocked in the wooden shoe. And the wind that sped them all night long ruffled the waves of dew. 
Now let's move from literature and take on the criticism Americans so often get for not speaking multiple languages. We must be the dumbest people on earth. Wait, that's not the problem. We Americans have simply had a different strategy for dealing with multiple languages. We have a history not of adding languages into our culture, but of leaving them behind as the best strategy for getting ahead. When our ancestors, mine for example in 1908, came to this new country with a language other than English, they threw it off as quickly as possible to turn the family into an English-speaking family. English spelled success for the next generation. In Europe, the opposite is true. The best strategy has been to know as many languages as possible for the best economic advantage. Think of it this way. Holland, for example, is not a big place. You go any distance at all and you plop down in someone else's country where a different language is spoken. Consequently, a person from Holland profits by knowing English, French, German, and Dutch, of course. But hey, that person also grew up hearing those languages as well as knowing people from those countries. Set any reasonably intelligent American little kid into that same situation and that kid also will be multilingual. It comes down to two different strategies for optimal cultural communication and success. Still, this is no excuse not to learn languages, okay? Learn them, and as many as possible. But just keep in mind that the next time someone is beating up on Americans for not knowing three languages, don't be too quick to hang your head. And before we jump into our next section, one final word about learning dates, the thing that turned me off from history when I was in high school. The secret is you don't need very many of them, just a handful. If you're really able to master a few dates, dates we're going to call key dates, you can hook everything else onto them, like Velcro or double stick tape. That's why for this course, we've kept the dates down to a circle of dates, and you can refer to it over and over again. Plus, you can keep track of events you find interesting on your own circle of dates. Meanwhile, let's move on to the topic of vocabulary. Vocabulary is the key to any study. Think about it. To learn about anything, we need vocabulary. Take baseball. It'd be pretty hard to discuss baseball without knowing what strike, foul, single, double, triple, and home run would mean. And that wouldn't be enough vocabulary. We'd need batter, hitter, catcher, outfielder, shortstop. The more serious we were about baseball, the more terms we'd want to learn. If we knew enough terms, we could easily discuss how a game of baseball is structured, or, to use a term we often use in music, we could discuss the form of baseball. We'd also learn the names of famous players from the past, and maybe even their impressive statistics. We'd learn about the teams and the players of today, the coaches, the stadiums, We'd look at pictures of old teams, and we'd watch excerpts from past games. The more we cared about baseball, the more terms and details we'd want to learn. Learning baseball terms, though, doesn't sound so hard, since we've grown up with so many of them. In fact, baseball terms are part of the common language, such as, boy, he really struck out with that idea, or I'd better step up to the plate. Some music terms do show up in general conversation, but most of them belong solely to music, and many of them will be new to you since Western music uses a vocabulary created largely by the Europeans, particularly the Italians. So, to talk clearly about music, we need to get a lot of terms under our belts, but that's not hard, I promise. Let's start with a basic question. When we hear music, what shall we call what we're hearing? A piece of music? A composition? a musical work, a song, or increasingly with iPods and MP3 downloads, a track. Actually, the word music is problematic. In many languages, French, German, Spanish, Russian, for example, the word music describes only the sound that floats through the air. I hear music, or I play music, or I love music. But in English, we also use music to describe the physical pages where the notes are written down. So a band director will ask a student to set her music out on the stand, 
or a pianist will tuck his music into the backpack. Well, that can really confuse people from other countries because Europeans have other words for sheets of paper where the circles, lines, and spaces are written. They call them scores or parts or notes. That word score is interesting. It goes way back to a time when music was engraved by hand or scored into metal plates. We'll talk more about engraving in the next unit. What about this word song? Today in pop culture, most pieces are called songs. Internet music services ask you if you want to download a song, even if it's a big Beethoven symphony. And more and more people are saying track to describe a piece of music. But for our study, we need to be specific. Song has a specific meaning. It's a piece of music that has words meant to be sung. Believe it or not, there's one exception to this. A few composers have written lyrical pieces for instruments only and called them songs. Felix Mendelssohn wrote a beautiful collection of songs without words. But overall, it's still fair to say that songs have words that are meant to be sung. So we need different designations for other types of music. Here's another good term, work, a musical work. Work is what I like to call a $10 word, a fancy word. Anything created by an artist can be called a work. The novels of Tolstoy are called literary works. A painting by Rembrandt or a sculpture by Henry Moore, even a beautifully crafted piece of furniture, can be called a work of art. The word work comes directly from the Latin word opus, which means a creative work. We still use that Latin term to catalog the order of a composer's publications. Opus 2 would be written earlier in a composer's career, while Opus 87 would be much later. And the term opus shows up in another big way. In Italian, opus is opera. And over time, opera became opera, meaning a sung work for the theater. You know, we could avoid all of these terms and simply describe music scientifically using the language of acoustics, the science that explains sound. We'll talk more about acoustics in a later unit. But meanwhile, Let's get back to some terms that help describe the way pieces of music are organized, starting with the term movement. Some musical works are just one long stretch of music, but many others are divided into sections or movements. A movement is a distinct section of a work. Generally, it has a clear beginning and a clear end. It can be short or long. Its speed or its tempo can be fast or slow, and we usually hear a bit of silence between the end of one movement and the beginning of the next, unless the composer writes ataka, which means attack the next movement or jump right into it. You can think of movements like a chapter in a book. How long is a chapter? How many chapters are in a book? Well, that depends on how the author chooses to divide the book. A chapter in a paperback today may be only a few pages long with big print, while a chapter in a chemistry textbook might be 40 pages long with small print and crammed with substance. But at various points in history, there have been conventions of popular taste that have determined how long a chapter will be. Charles Dickens, for example, knew how to write chapters for his readers. His novels were intended for serial publication in newspapers, one episode or chapter at a time. The chapters of his hit novel, Pickwick Papers, for example, appeared in installments between 1836 and 1837, most with 32 pages of text, two engraved illustrations, and 16 pages of advertisement, exactly what people expected. Take the same idea and apply it to music. In the 1780s, when Mozart was writing a lot of music, a movement of a symphony had an expected length and content. About 25 years later, when Beethoven was writing some of his most important music, movements of symphonies had gotten longer, especially Beethoven's. Throughout the 19th century, the length of symphony movements continued to grow, and people's ears had to catch up with the new, longer lengths. 
movements, generally speaking, continue to get longer and longer and longer until the First World War, when the world exploded in 1914. World War I changed almost everything in European culture. Musical systems fractured as well. The drastic times altered people's perception and expectations, not only of art, but of the entire world. In a clear reaction, movements of most musical works became dramatically shorter and consequently more intense. Part of our goal in studying music history is to track and explain such changes. Let me say that again. We want to track the changes and learn how to explain them. And along those lines, it's not always wars, revolutions, and human circumstances that drive change in music. Frequently, it's technology. Back in 1850, a song could be any length from a single minute to 15 minutes or more. It depended on the length of the poem or the text, the words that were to be sung. And it also depended on how the text was set to music. But starting around the 1890s, with the rise of the gramophone, it was the technology, not the text, that dictated the length of a song. How many vibrations could be etched into the grooves of a single wax cylinder or a flat recording disc? Depending on how closely the grooves were cut, most cylinders or discs during the gramophone era could play for close to three minutes. So guess what? The length of popular songs quickly standardized to three minutes. I find that to be one of the most astonishing changes in all of music history. For centuries, songs could be any length, and suddenly composers need to write three-minute songs. It's a great example of how the marketplace takes over. Composers had to accept the three-minute length of songs if they wanted their songs to be recorded and to sell. That technological factor determined the internal structure and, to a great degree, the overall dramatic shape of popular music. A three-minute song had to stay simple and to build quickly to fit the new medium of delivery. Well, what about recordings of longer works like Beethoven symphonies and operas? They certainly didn't last just three minutes. Believe it or not, people still recorded some of them, starting with a famous gramophone recording of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in 1913. Imagine doing that three minutes at a time. It took many discs. It was expensive, complicated, and bulky. Overall, not very satisfactory, not only because of the time limit, but also because no one had invented a microphone yet that was able to pick up anything resembling the full range of sounds coming from an orchestra. All of the sounds so far had to be transferred mechanically, acoustically, as physical vibrations coming into a big wooden or metal acoustical horn. But then the electronic microphone was invented in the 1920s and it became possible to amplify sound. Radio came along right about the same time which definitely changed how songs were spread throughout the culture. A few decades later, 1948 is part of the post-World War II technology boom, the long playing recording or LP would be invented. When microgroove technology came along, it became possible to put 20 minutes or more of music on each side of a long playing record. About the same time, recording tape was invented, and later came CDs. Even now, there are still limits on how much music you can have on a CD, but your iTunes, well, that's limited only by how much computer memory you have, and who knows what the future will bring. And speaking of who knows what the future will bring, here's something I want to share with you. It reminds us that a person, especially a young person, never knows what the future has in store. That's the message I heard from a special American singer I was fortunate to hear and to speak with. Sergeant First Class Powell, that was a wonderful performance. Thank you, ma'am. Beautiful concert. Thank you. Is it fun to get up there and do that on an occasion like this? It is fun. It's very fun. Um, I've been singing a long time, and I started in grade school singing. But at that time, I didn't know that I was going to make it a career, you know, all through junior high school and through high school. And it was just a, a hobby. I, I loved singing, but I didn't really take it serious until college and all of that. Um, 
I also did uh, some junior high school and high school band. I played clarinet for 15 years. Oh. A lot of people don't know that, but ah. that's okay. I don't play anymore. <laughs> Secret is out, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, anybody that's in the band system or want to sing, I just say persevere. Uh, if you feel that you're talented or whether you just have a love and you work hard, you work very hard, things can happen for you. There are other ways to make um, a career in music, not just... Uh, well, certainly as a civilian, but hey, the military, the armed forces, have, you know, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and uh, the Army, and you can definitely have a career in music in those uh, forces, and I'm an example of that. It's been a good career, it really has been. Do you have a, when you think about the many places you've sung and the things you've seen, do, does one thing just jump out that you thought you would never achieve an opportunity perhaps like that? To sing at a president's inauguration, to stand there in front of hundreds of thousands of people and to know that millions of people around the world are watching uh, was an opportunity that I will never forget. That probably jumps out more than anything else. Me being from a small town, Cape Charles, Virginia, never thinking that I'd get that opportunity. And, you know, I just feel like if it can happen for me, it can happen for a lot more people. Let's close this section on song by getting to know one of the great songwriters of the 19th century, German composer Robert Schumann. Back in 1840, Schumann was writing an enormous number of songs. He was head over heels in love with Clara Wieck, the woman he eventually married after he battled her father and ended up getting the court's permission to marry. When he was writing all of these songs, was he worried about getting his songs down to three minutes? Heavens no. He was worried only about which poems to pick and how to set these poems to vocal melodies with piano accompaniment. He thought about who would sing them, and whether the notes of the vocal line lay in the right register, the high or low part of the voice. And he thought about how his beloved Clara might like them. I'm sure he thought about a lot of things, but not about a three-minute time frame. And for music lovers, it's a good thing he didn't have that limitation. By the way, I'm mostly going to say he when I discuss composers, unless I'm referring to a composer who was a woman. Yes, there are oodles of female composers in history, many of them quite important, particularly in recent decades, when opportunities for men and women in music are far more equalized. But we'll be considering music written mostly by men. No matter how many talented women there were on the scene back then, there weren't females who had careers equivalent to Bach and Mozart, Beethoven and Brahms. So expect to hear he and his a lot. Meanwhile, review the terms and concepts in this unit, and we'll spend Unit 2 considering some of the biggest events in Western cultural history, events that definitely had an impact on music.